Hi, I'm Jan Stewart, the Melvin R. Seaden Curator of Chinese Art at the National Museum of Asian Art, which is comprised of the Freer Gallery of Art and the Arthur M. Sackler Gallery. I'm here today with two of my colleagues. We'll each introduce ourselves, and our plan is to show you some extraordinary ceramics. Stacy. And I'm Stacy Pearson. I'm a professor at SOAS at the University of London, and I specialize in the history of Chinese ceramics. And I'm Louise Court. I retired last year as curator for ceramics at the Freer and Sackler Galleries, and I'm now curator emerita. The ceramics that we have selected to show today are in celebration of an installation we have in our world-famous Peacock Room that is a work of art itself painted by James McNeil Whistler, and the dining room originally held Chinese porcelains, blue and white porcelains, and it is currently installed with blue and white, called Harmony in Blue and White. So we thought we would come downstairs into the vaults to look at some examples that might exemplify different aspects of the complicated story of ceramics made in China and exported to different markets. So we're going to start with a charger, a large plate that's very typical of the kind of ware that was made and exported to Europe. All of us are going to talk about this work together, but we're looking at something that is painted with blue, cobalt. Do you want to talk about cobalt a little bit? Yeah, now cobalt um, is one of the ideal pigment in the potter and the glassmaker's repertoire because obviously it produces a beautiful color, but it's also very strong. So you don't need a lot of it to achieve a really strong color. Mm. It's also, in the examples you see here, painted on top of the porcelain, but underneath a layer of glaze. And so what you have is a permanent design that is highlighted by this really glossy, beautiful porcelain glaze. Also, with a ware like this, we know the kiln it was made at. So it's often called in English the porcelain capital of the world, Jingdezhen in South China. Now, one of the things that we thought would be fun to point out in the design on this piece is, can you see there are peacocks? Hmm. We have no evidence that there is any direct connection in the mind of James Menil Whistler when he chose peacock decoration for the room of the peacock room, but this is the kind of porcelain that the original patron, uh, Leland, had for the room decor. So Whistler may, he was very familiar himself, he collected, he was very interested in this uh, early 18th century kind of blue and white. Mm -hmm. So he may have been playing with this motif as well. And Whistler, of course, was buying blue and white porcelain like this, um, mainly in the Dutch market, because this kind of porcelain had been exported in huge quantities to the Netherlands by the Dutch East India Company, and it was readily available and not too expensive. So that's one of the reasons why he started to incorporate these into his paintings. Mm -hmm. And by the time Whistler started collecting, it had been in the Netherlands for a hundred years or so? At least, yeah, yeah, at least. yeah. At least. yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Was it still in fashion in the Netherlands? Or yeah, it doesn't able to seem buy it cheap? It doesn't seem to have really fallen out of fashion in the Netherlands as it did in England. So at the time Whistler bought his first piece, which I think was 1863, um, it had really fallen out of fashion in England. And he and his colleagues started buying it, using it in their painting, installing it in interiors, and it really brought back this so-called China mania that we had only seen a um, hundred years earlier. One other point that's useful to make, in the 20th century, plates like this are usually called export porcelain. 
but perhaps it's more precise to say porcelain that was exported. Although this type wasn't hugely popular in China, certainly there is a much greater crossover between domestic Chinese markets and what they also mass produced to send overseas. So we're looking at something that was wildly popular at one time in Europe, but it was not exclusively made for just one market. And so many of these pieces that we assume were just made for Europe incorporate a lot of really traditional Chinese designs and motifs. Mm -hmm. Now, we thought we'd give you a surprise and switch to another kind of ware that we know was made in quantity for the purpose of export. And among other things. Yeah. Among other things. <laughs> and so we're going to introduce a ware that comes from a different kiln. Right. This uh, deep bowl is uh, made in southern Fujian province in the cluster, large cluster of kilns around the city of Zhangzhou. And uh, this particular piece was bought out of a collection that had been in Japan since the 17th century. The Zhangzhou kilns were very active in the second half of the 16th, early, the first half of the 17th century. If you compare them to the kind of painting on Jingde Junware, um, they're much looser, more casual, and uh, this bowl in particular goes beyond the use of cobalt to also use uh, brown pigment, this um, an iron pigment used also under the glaze, and um, a curious black pigment, and we really haven't studied it to find out exactly what it consists of, and then white pigment, which is um, made from the same clay that the porcelain bowl is made of, diluted and used like a paint. And the designs on the inside are two wild dragons who are circling around um, among clouds. So circling it's a, a pearl. Yeah. It's a classic Chinese design, but the interpretation is very loose and folkish in a way. Now this kind of export porcelain uh, the many different kinds of porcelain that were made at the Zhangzhou kilns uh, were hugely influential in Japan uh, in ways that Japanese art historians are just beginning to understand. Um, they're found all over the place, they're excavated in huge quantities, and many of them, like this dish, have been passed down as heirlooms. It's also a type of ware that's known by different names. Right, that's right. So it was exported from a particular area, uh, Shanto, and the way that name got either translated into Dutch or into English and coming from the dialect spoken in Fujian, they're often called Swatow wares. Mm. But today that name is not used so much. We talk about the kiln, Zhangzhou. Well, I love the way um, they've used cobalt on this piece to, mm. to actually color the glaze. So yes. whereas here so you have cobalt used to paint the decoration, mm -hmm. same pigment is being used to create this lovely grayish blue glaze. And that tells me that the kind of cobalt they're using oh is a form known as aspalite. So it has manganese in it. Oh. And that gives you this kind of lovely, slightly grayish, ever so slightly purplish tone. Oh. And I also like the way they use the white slip to yes. give an interesting kind of surface texture yeah. mm -hmm. to the decoration. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I think that use of white slip is fairly typical of colored Zhangzhou wares. Oh, it occurs on dishes that are just done with blue glaze, just done with brown glaze. This rich combination of blue, brown, and, blue, brown, and white is rather unusual. And you can see the white is quite thick. If you yeah. put your finger on the surface of the dish, it actually is raised from the surface. You, you feel that it has been applied very thickly. Right. And actually, that's a use of white slip that shows up in Japanese ceramics from then on. Oh, so it's one of the things that Japanese potters learned from these. Do you think we dare turn this over and show the bottom? The sure. One thing that's useful to um, show with regard to Zhangzhou wares is the 
the telltale messy base. Um, the potters were working to decorate and glaze the piece, but they didn't really pay any attention to what was going on underneath the bowl, assuming that no one would be looking. And another, uh, so glaze has run all over the bowl in various ways. But then another uh, sign of a Zhangzhou production on the base is this deposit of gravel, which is stuck in the glaze, uh, which shows that rather than being carefully stacked in saggers, um, the Zhangzhou pieces were just put directly on some sort of, of uh, gravel deposit in the kiln. Uh, again, the potters weren't trying to make a perfect piece, they were trying to quickly make something that would work and be sellable. And you would use that grit to keep it from sticking to yes. the kiln shelf. Now, it's also my understanding that these monochrome ones, the blue ones and the brown ones, appear in collections in the Middle East. Is that correct? Um, ah, certainly in Persia. That's yeah. right. Mm. That's right. There are some. And in uh, Turkey. Yes, of course, in Turkey, in the Ottoman Palace yeah. collection. Yeah. yeah. So I think they had a really wide market um, for these types of wares. Right. Mm. And it's nice and sturdy, very utilitarian. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it would be much heavier and thicker than this one, for example. But I hope you can see clearly the dragons. They're just the sweetest things. Look at the horn, the white horn that stands up from the head. And look at the sort of, it's almost like fur on the lower jaw, the way, the way it comes down. So we want you to enjoy the painting the way we do. Yeah. And white pigment used to paint the dragon's teeth, I think, is very effective here. Yeah. Just, yeah. <laughs> so moving from something fun from this kiln, we're going to return to the first kiln we started with, the Jingda Jun kiln, and go back to blue and white where the design is painted with the cobalt oxide. So here is a vessel called a kendi. It's not a shape that was important in Chinese culture. It's a shape that has an overseas market. It's a water bottle. It's a drinking bottle. And when you hold it, you can fill it with water from the top. And you can pass it around with people having the water sort of lightly poured into their mouth without their having to put their lips on the spout. So you can use it to drink water without having somebody else's germs on the rim of what you're going to be drinking from. And in fact, you could hold on to the long neck and hold it up and shoot the water directly into your mouth. I think that's how it was often we in a museum never pick something up just by its <laughs> neck, so I can't quite demonstrate that for okay. you. But the, the prototype for this, um, the, the word candy is Millet. Um, it comes out of vessels made for the market in Southeast Asia, especially among uh, Muslim clients um, who had a concern for the purity of the water that was being used in various ways. Uh, so this is a, a Southeast Asian shape, kind of, um, but ornamented with Chinese decoration. Late 15th century, would you say? Or oh. do you have a, I, I think we've, yeah, maybe playing later. with Placing it there, we also look at things from shipwrecks, where there are similar examples with fairly long necks. One of the things with ceramics or any kind of art object is in different time periods, there are subtle shifts in the shape, subtle shifts in the decoration, sometimes in the raw materials that are used. So all these together allow us as colleagues to talk about placing date, but all of these are undated pieces. So we can't always tell you precisely when something was made. So we're, mm. we're judging on those factors. But also, a number of these designs would definitely place it into at least 
as early as about 1488, um, oh. including this one just around the shoulder, which you do see on imperial Chinese blue and white, particularly in the yeah. Chenghua period. And the Chenghua emperor reigned from 1465 to 87. There's also, you mentioned shipwrecks. There was a shipwreck um, that is roughly dated to the time of his successor, 1488 to about 1505, um, in which they found a number of vessels like this mm -hmm. um, with actually quite similar decoration. And then there's the painting style as well. That particular technique of painting the blue um, is quite typical of the later 15th century, moving into the early mm -hmm. 16th the century. flowers. Yeah, these flowers on the neck in particular mm -hmm. are more delicate than we would expect from something much earlier. So that, again, would push it into a slightly later date. Now there is a very fun aspect about how it's made. Fingerprints. <laughs> so I can't reproduce how a potter would have held it for fear of dropping it. But you can imagine an experienced hand, we can see a fingerprint here, 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 an experienced hand would have been able to hold this one hand and dip it into a vat of glaze. So that's how it's glazed. No way I'm going to reproduce that for you. But here's perhaps one you can see very clearly. Because the finger was there, the glaze did not cover the body the way you see the glaze next to it. But it's wonderful and to this, see the hand of the maker in the piece. Hmm. And then the glaze was wiped off the bottom so it could sit in the kiln without melting onto the kiln shelf. Another aspect of this that's interesting to me looking at it today is this shape of the uh, neck and top. I think that's probably based mm. on um, a metal shape, maybe a silver mm. cap that would originally have gone on a bottle like this. We have a Japanese version that came out of Indonesia that has a very similar tooled silver uh, cap on it. This is a kind of abbreviated... So originally, do you think it would have had some kind of cap or been stuffed with something to keep the water pure? I think it would have had some kind of improvised stopper, but yeah. probably not a separate porcelain cap. Right. Yeah. Too much work. Hmm. And of course, Later versions of these were also made. Um, they found similar ones um, from about 1643 in a shipwreck. And we know that that was a Dutch East India Company ship. And so those pieces were destined for the Dutch market. And you do see this mm. shape in mm -hmm. some Dutch still life yeah. paintings. As a kind of yeah. curiosity, right? Right. Exactly. right. And mm -hmm. some of these candy are even made and shaped like animals, like elephants uh, and things. Mm -hmm. And those were very popular in Europe as well. So, you know, wonderful exotic vessel. Nobody in Europe used it for drinking, but it took on a decorative value. Stacy, what do you think about the color of the cobalt on this piece? What does it tell you about the material? Well, the color of the cobalt on this piece is absolutely typical of these types of wares. Um, you can see it's somewhat variable. Um, and it has... See how dark it gets and yeah. how light. And it has run slightly because um, the glaze is quite fluid, which is not untypical of these wares. It also has a somewhat grayish tone to it, mm. um, which is also typical of the... Um, what you might call popular wares that were made you know, in huge quantities at, in this particular time period. So it suggests to me that they're using perhaps not the most expensive cobalt pigment, but they're certainly using a lot of it. They're using a lot of it. Mm -hmm. And it's fun. Uh, just a shot of the delicacy of the scene with a little flying insect among the flowers. So as much as we love this pot, we have a shift, another wonderful pot. And this one, of course, is of a type that actually a Dutch name is used for. Um, this is a particular type of blue and white porcelain with these radiating panels coming out from the center that is popularly known as crock porcelain. They can be small like this, but oftentimes they're significantly larger. And this, of course, 
gains its name partly through exposure from um, Dutch East India Company maritime activities. Hundreds of thousands of these were produced and shipped all over to Europe, to Japan, there's quite a few of them, yep. um, Southeast Asia. Some of these are also appearing in um, Middle Eastern imperial collections. So it was one of the most successful blue and white types ever produced in China. And it might be a bit surprising, but actually, and we, we date this to the 17th century, uh, there were examples of 17th century crockware found in the James River Valley of Virginia. So it's definitely connected to American life as well. That's one reason we wanted to share this. And it has a wonderful little painting, if you can see inside, a praying mantis sitting on a rock and flowers above. This design you can also see on Dutch deltware copies of crock porcelain from China. Hmm. And on Japanese copies. And on Japanese copies, porcelain. yeah. yeah. Which for a time were actually commissioned by the Dutch East India Company, I oh. understand, yes. So trade is so complicated. And one thing we hope people will be able to keep in mind is it's not always linear. It's like billiard balls bouncing around on a table. One, the cue hits one ball that hits another ball that hits another ball. It's all moving around. But these pieces we're looking at today all begin in Chinese kilns. 